anti-creationists can be found everywhere, especially on the internet. Handling the Critics, this week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Our topic this week is handling the critics. How do we handle <laughs> critics? Well, Christians are being persecuted more and more throughout the Western world as secular humanism continues to grow. That's true. But nowhere is criticism and, and ridicule poured out more than upon biblical creationists. That yep. Those are the people that take the Bible as plainly written. Uh, so much so that some of the most negative comments come from Christians. Who've, who've actually right. bought into evolutionary thinking, and then they criticize other believers that take the Bible as plainly written. And of course, biblical creationists, for the most part, are we're unapologetic in declaring the Bible, all parts of the Bible, as authoritative, true, and the final say in all matters. Right. Yeah. Biblical creationists aren't compromisers, and so it's hard to try to find a chink in their armor, so to speak, mm -hmm. as far as consistency is concerned. As anti-creationist Jerry Coyne said when reviewing two books from theistic evolutionists, a people who believe God used evolution, he said this, mm -hmm. without good cause, Giberson and Miller, these are the two theistic evolutionists, pick and choose what they believe. At least young earth creationists are consistent for they embrace supernatural causation across the board. Right, well, I'll take that We're as consistent. a backhanded compliment, I actually. I guess, yeah. <laughs> However, the attacks never stop. And one concentrated attack came from uh, Lawrence Lerner. He's a retired uh, professor uh, of condensed matter physics, and he wrote the report, Good Science, Bad Science, Teaching Evolution in the States. And today we're going to be using this re report as an example of how to handle creation critics. Okay, yeah, his report made news headlines. It graded all 50 state curricula. Uh, now, you'd think that an assessment of good science and bad science would assess real sciences, <laughs> like physics and chemistry and experimental biology and those kinds of things, yeah. on how effectively the concepts are taught, the, the concepts taught, are retained and grasped by students. Right. But that's not what he did. His evaluation of science teaching was based solely on how favorably each state curriculum <laughs> deals with biological evolution. Right, <laughs> yeah. He, he, he's yeah. judging it on history, not science, but right. anyway. Anyway, 10 uh, states scored A, uh, meaning in learner's opinion, treatment of evolution is very good or excellent. Okay. And uh, of course, the, the, the grades, um, drop as evolution is treated less dogmatically. Uh, while one state, Kansas, received an F for allegedly uh, removing all references to biological uh, oh, evolution. Oh dear, yeah. yeah. Lerner's report contained a lot of rhetoric and logical fallacies and little real science, the kind of science that leads to technological advancements that develop smartphones and cure diseases and that, that, that type of thing. Yeah, well, as is typical with most uh, creation critics, uh, yes. Lerner's report commits the fallacy of equivocation. And this is something every biblical uh, creationist needs to recognize in order to be able to handle critics. Um, equivocation is, is switching the meaning of, of the word, in, in this case evolution, the word evolution, uh, partway through an argument. A common tactic is, right. is simply to produce examples of change over time. You call that evolution and then imply that the general theory of evolution is therefore proven and creation is disproven, etc. Right. The main scientific objection to evolution is not that changes occur through time, uh, and it's not about the size of the change. Mm -hmm. so, so we would discourage the use of terms like micro and macro evolution because it can introduce confusion there. The key issue is the type of change. To change microbes in, into men, for example, requires that increase to the genetic information content takes place mm -hmm. over you know, millions of years, from half a million DNA letters, even from, from even the simplest rep self-reproducing organism that could be called life, right. to more than about three billion letters stored in each human uh, cell. Right, how'd you get the all the new there. information? Yeah. yeah, how does that come about? Nothing in Lerner's paper or, or anywhere else provides a single example of functional 
new information being added to the DNA. Right. Lerner's paper alludes to several points as evidence for evolution. However, many of them are simply examples of change over time. So these aren't disputed by creationists. Right. Uh, but the implication throughout is that without evolution, it would be impossible to understand that um, all living things reproduce, offspring are similar uh, to but not exactly like their parents, offspring have to grow up or change and metamorphosis, uh, et cetera, before reproducing themselves. There is a fit between individuals or species and their environment. Um, natural selection determines the different uh, differential survival of groups of organisms. So here, here's all these points he's making that he says evolution has to be true in order for us to be able to understand these things. Right. Yeah. But Bible-believing scientists, creationists, agree with all of those things. <laughs> exactly. But observing the reality of these concepts doesn't depend on evolution. That's right. So uh, to claim that because there is change proves information increasing change can occur is like saying that because a merchant sells goods, yeah. he can sell them for a profit. Right. The, the two are related, but just because the former happens doesn't mean the latter will. The origin of information is a major problem for evolution. Yeah, and equivocation, uh, it has to be exposed for what it is. These, these uh, bait and switch tactics by evolutionists are, you know, once they're exposed, most of their scientific case for the general theory of evolution collapses. And we'll be back. How do fish survive in Antarctic waters without freezing? The answer is that their blood plasma has lots of antifreeze protein that bind to ice and prevent the crystals from growing and thus causing damage. Some evolutionists claim that this is an example of evolution in action because new DNA code has been created that codes for the antifreeze protein. But does this really support molecules to man evolution? Antifreeze proteins are quite different from the complex specific proteins found elsewhere in the fish or in our own bodies. They are simple proteins which may have arisen through the duplication of a digestive enzyme gene that lost its original function due to mutations scrambling it. Even though they fortuitously prevent ice crystals from growing, this is a very non-specific job that many different random proteins could perform. So, even though antifreeze proteins help fish survive, they don't explain how complex specific proteins could arise by mutations. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, if you just tuned in today, we're talking about handling the critics. Yes, well, another thing to watch for when handling critics' arguments is checking whether to see, uh, to see whether they're representing creationist arguments well or whether they're simply setting up straw man arguments to knock down. For example, Lerner claims, he says this, most creationists admit the possibility of microevolution but deny that the process can proceed so as to result in diverse species, let alone the still broader spectra of living things. Straw man. Yep. <laughs> uh, we, we don't deny speciation. In fact, it's an important part of the creationist model, yep. creationist biology. We, we did two shows on this last year, episode 19 and 20 of season four. Exactly. Yeah, creationists starting from the Bible believe that God created different kinds of organisms which reproduced after their kinds. Right. Thus, the, the biblical kind would have originally been distinct uh, biological species, that is a, a population of organisms that can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. Yeah, originally. Originally. But that can't, uh, you know, so they can't breed with other organisms. But, but creationists point out that the, the kind is larger than one of today's species, right. right? This is because each of the original kinds was created with a vast amount of genetic information. There was enough variety in the original uh, uh, the information in the original creatures, so that uh, their descendants could adapt to a wide variety of environments. Yeah, loss of information through mutations, copying mistakes, sometimes results in individuals in the same species being unable to produce offspring. At that point, a single species has become two. Right. Uh, as a result of degenerating change, a degenerative change, not the kind of change required to evolve particles into people, <laughs> or or changes in the song or color of, of birds might result in them no longer being able to recognize a mate, and, and so they no longer interbreed. Mm -hmm. Either way, a new species is formed. So each created kind may have had the same ancestor of several present-day species. Again, today, kind is not the same as species. Yeah. Today. It's important to stress that speciation has has nothing uh, to do with real evolution because it involves sorting and loss of genetic information right. rather than new information. Lerner mocks the idea of, of uh, kinds by claiming this. In creationist literature, however, the breadth of a kind can vary from a species to a phylum, including everything in between. 
but, but this is fallacious. Right. Um, creationists have uh, pointed out that as long as, they, uh, as two creatures can hybridize with true fertilization, the two creatures are of the same kind. Yeah, they go back to the same kind. Yep. Also, if two creatures can hybridize with, the, with, the same, with, with a third creature, they're all members of the same kind. Right. Any problems with the, the breadth of a kind are actually due to inconsistencies in the man-made classification system, not the term kind. Mm -hmm. That is, organisms classified as different species, even different genera or, or higher groupings, can, if they can produce fertile offspring, this means that they're really the same species uh, or really the same kind originally. And uh, 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 you have different, uh, the, the word kind is, is different than the word species. That's the main thing to understand. Right. Some atheistic skeptics have demanded that creationists should list every single kind. Of, of course, to even begin to do so, it would be necessary to perform hybridization experiments on all sexually reproducing organisms. So this is pretty unreasonable. Yeah. And, uh, and no evolutionist has ever listed all biological species anyway, as opposed to a, a list of organisms classified into arbitrary man-made uh, groupings classified as species. And the skeptics' demand for a list of every single kind overlooks the fact that, uh, 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 by definition, uh, th this isn't the only way to define these things, right? So, right. so the hybridization criteria is, is a far more reasonable operational definition, which could, in principle, enable researchers to, you know, list all of the links. Right. Lerner also mocked much yeah, the, the same way as the compromising apologist Hugh Ross does. Mm. He said this, in order to avoid overcrowding Noah's Ark, some creationists adhere to the biblical term kinds rather than species as the limiting barrier to evolution. Yeah. Well, yeah. well <laughs> the, the creationist concept of kind has nothing to do with trying to fit things on the Ark, but based on sound <laughs> biblical exegesis and the concept of hybridization. In reality, the converse right. is true. Skeptics hate the creationist analysis of kinds, partly because it neutralizes skeptical attacks on yeah. the ark that try to pack in the, you know, the millions of species they're, they're always talking yes. about, including many which are marine, invertebrate, or, or, or plant anyway, um, so, you know, could have survived off of the ark. Right, yeah. It's sad seeing self-professed Christian apologists like Hugh Ross parrot these really atheistic attacks on a global flood and the ark and to re resorting to long disproven notions of the fixity of species to maintain his old earth compromise. Exactly. Uh, we're, we're supposed to be on the same side here, but his position is the result of not taking God's word in the way that it's written. And we'll be back with more on that shortly. Creation Magazine is a 56-page, full-color family magazine that is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page is full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for lay people, every effort is made to ensure the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied, and young children look forward to the section written especially for them. Visit creation.com to get your subscription. On this week's episode, we're talking about handling the critics. How do we handle common critical objections to creation arguments? Right, and we're talking about Lerner's paper. And yes. it, it, this has all of the classical arguments. Uh, for example, he claims that evolution occupies a central place and has a unifying role in the life sciences and that creationist right. thinking ca can't help advanced science, so on. Yeah, but since he didn't define evolution properly, the claim is unsound. Uh, certainly, it's important and, and obvious that things change. <laughs> But what exactly would be lost from real science if the evolution if evolution were disbelieved, the evolutionary theory were disbelieved? Yeah. It, it's, is it really necessary for scientists be to believe that microbes changed into mice, magnolias, and man <laughs> to perform research in biology, immunology, and cosmology, for example? Uh, Newton, Pasteur, Mendel, uh, <laughs> many others didn't seem to need to believe evolution to do their science. Yeah, and I'd like to challenge Lerner to name a single discovery right. uh, in his own specialty of the physics of condensed matter that had the slightest thing to do with believing that particles change into people without any intelligent guidance. I mean, the shoe's actually on the other, other foot here. Right, yeah. but, but nevertheless, Lerner asserts, he says this, creationists have made no contribution to the progress of biology or any other of the historical sciences. 
He's uninformed, obviously. Two things here. First, he acknowledges that uh, Origins research is a historical science, not a repeatable, observable, operational science, yeah, which, is, which is good. But uh, secondly, this is a blatantly false claim, not just a matter of opinion or interpretation. Many key aspects in, in biology, as well as the other major branches of, of modern science, were discovered by creationists. Yeah. For example, you, you mentioned Louis Pasteur discovered that uh, many diseases were caused by germs and showed that life comes only from life. Gregor Mendel uh, discovered genetics, and Carus, uh, Carolus uh, Linnaeus de developed the modern classification system. So what right. is he talking about? Yeah, yeah, and today many scientists, including biologists, contribute greatly to their field despite believing in biblical creation and disbelieving evolution. You can see a list of some of them if you go to creation.com slash creation scientists. It's a huge list including PhD scientists and, and researchers that believe in biblical creation. Right, and, and also people that learn their praises you know, for their con contribution to astronomy, Copernicus, Kepler, uh, Galileo, Newton, they were also young Earth creationists. <laughs> yes. uh, but he doesn't inform his readers of this, apparently. Yeah, uh, many historians uh, of a wide range of religious persuasions, from Christians to atheists, point out that the basis of modern science depends on the assumption that the universe was made by a rational, <laughs> orderly creator. Yeah. An orderly universe makes perfect sense only if it were made by an orderly creator who established natural laws that don't change, because God doesn't change, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But if atheism or, or, or polytheism were true, then there's no way to deduce from these belief systems that the universe should operate according to fixed laws. Exactly. And, and Genesis 1.28 gives us permission to investigate creation. Unlike, yes. uh, say, animism or, or pantheism that teaches that the creation itself is divine. And, and since God's right. sovereign, he, he was free to create as he pleased. So. Where the Bible's silent, the only way to find out how his creation works is to experiment, uh, not to rely on man-made philosophies as like, the, like the ancient Greeks did. Right. Note that creationists regard natural laws as descriptions of the way God upholds his creation in a regular, repeatable way, while miracles are God's way of upholding his creation in a special way for special reasons. Right. Um, because uh, creation finished at the end of day six, creationists following the Bible would expect that God has since uh, mostly worked through natural laws, yes. except where yep. he's revealed in the Bible that he used a miracle. And since natural laws are descriptive, uh, they cannot prescribe what cannot happen. They can't rule out miracles. Right. Uh, scientific laws uh, don't cause or forbid anything any more than the, the outline of a map causes the shape of a coastline. Uh, so up next, understanding the belief system behind the claims of the critics. Many people think that the biblical flood of Noah was abandoned because of the evidence. However, history tells a different story. Modern geological thought owes much to a man named Charles Lyell. Lyell, a lawyer, published a book in 1830 called Principles of Geology. Described as a masterpiece of persuasion, it changed the way people thought about Earth's past. According to Lyell, we should only appeal to today's geological processes to explain Earth history. However, this approach meant that the global flood recorded in the Bible was automatically ruled out of consideration. Lyell wanted, he wrote, to free the science of geology from Moses. Regrettably, many people have uncritically adopted Lyell's philosophy without considering how Noah's flood can help us understand Earth history. Lyell changed the way many people think, but his approach was motivated by his anti-biblical philosophy. Indeed, it is very difficult to explain Earth's history without Noah's flood. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Welcome back. Our subject today is handling creation critics. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> now, a, a critical concept in handling critics is understanding the belief system behind their claims. Right. Des despite what many evolutionists claim, creationists aren't the only ones whose belief systems affect their interpretation of the data. Rather, both sides are biased here. That, that's right. While learners uh, report pretends that evolution is not anti-religious, it's important to realize that the leaders of evolutionary thought were and are ardently opposed to the notion of the Christian God as revealed in the Bible. Yep. You, you, you can see a who's who of evolutionists at creation.com slash who's who, and you can see a list of some of them there. Exactly. Even uh, evolutionists themselves, like Stephen Jay Gould, 
have shown that, uh, and, and others beside him as well, have shown yeah, that Darwin's yeah. purpose in promoting evolution was to find an alternative to the idea of a divine designer. And, and Richard uh, Dawkins applauses evolution because he claims that before Darwin, it was impossible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist, right. as he says. Yeah. Kansas State University immunologist Scott Todd asserted, he said this, even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it's not naturalistic. <laughs> so, okay, never mind the facts, nature is all there is. Right. Naturalism is king, naturalism defines the rules of the game that origin is played by. Mm -hmm. So opposition, so the, the opposition to creation has nothing to do with the facts. But Evidently, they need to point out that creationists refuse to play by the self-serving rules of the game right. uh, formulated by materialists. Uh, this contrasts with what most people think science is all about. For example, double, norial, uh, double Nobel laureate uh, Linus Pauling says, he says this, science is the search for truth. Right. That's a pretty simple definition, yeah. and if you go with that, it doesn't matter what the conclusions are. So you, you follow the facts to their natural conclusion, whether they're naturalistic or not. Right. <laughs> so how do uh, Lerner and others uh, try to get around the charge that evolution is really pushing uh, the religion of humanism? After all, uh, the first two tenets of the Humanist Manifesto II from 1973, signed by many prominent evolutionists, are this. One, religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Humanism believes that man is part of nature and has emerged as a result of a continuous process. Now, the current version, Humanist Manifesto 2000, was signed by the prominent evolutionary propagandist Richard Dawkins, E.O. Wilson, yeah. uh, Richard Leakey, uh, Moylan Matsuma, and uh, Daniel Dennett. Well. They, they try to make it sound like creation is a faith uh, system and, and, and evolution is science, but that isn't the case. Right. Lerner himself is a member of the Bay Area Skeptics. Uh, like all skeptical groups, it's essentially atheistic and anti-Christian. Uh, but the Bay Area Skeptics downplays this claim, saying that, uh, they say this, we're absolutely not a religious or anti-religious group. We respect the religions and non-religious beliefs of others and recognize that spirituality is based on faith and is not testable. Now, this is a, another important tactic to understand from skeptics. They have a faith-based religious belief system yep. called humanism. Everyone has beliefs that govern how they think and live. Exactly. So. What, what's interesting here is to see how many Christians get sucked into this kind of thinking. Yeah, so, a lot hey, of them. Yeah, science is all about naturalism, and it's what we can discover, uh, you know, that they've defined science that way. Yes. And then Christians go, oh, okay, but they, they, they don't even realize that they just cut off their own legs. If you're saying everything happened, everything we can investigate, touch, feel, smell, real science, all ha happens through naturalistic terms. You cannot invoke a designer. You cannot do that. Yes. You're, you're actually yeah. cutting your own legs off. If scientific investigation ends up pointing to a conclusion that is supernatural, they have to censor that out and, and say, well, no, no, we got to steer that in the direction of naturalism because, oh, we can't, we, can't go with, we can't go with something that's supernatural. It's a, it's a self-censoring that goes on there. Yeah. Amazing. But, you know, these, these guys are willing to say that if we walk into a cave and we find like a, a, you know, an arrowhead and we find some paintings on walls, well, we can conclude that, you know, hominid-like creatures once lived here and they intelligently did these things. Sure. We can recognize the design and intelligence. Yeah. But as long as it, so, so a, a, a human creator could have created that. Right. But as soon as you take it one step beyond and somebody creates the human, Not oh, no, 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 yeah. that's when you put the, pull the brakes on here. So um, there's a great book that we, we, we carry, actually, uh, Christianity for Skeptics, it's, it's called. Yes. And you can uh, check out that book on our website and give you some more answers to handle skeptics. We'll be back. Many Christians today have a diminished view of the Bible because they can't answer questions like, is there really a God? What about evolution? Are there facts to back up the Bible? Or is it all just faith? Creation Ministries expert speakers visit churches all over the world to help pastors equip their congregations to understand that the whole Bible, even Genesis, is accurate. We help to demolish the arguments that the world uses to try to convince people that the Bible isn't true. For more information on getting a CMI speaker to visit your church, contact your nearest CMI office through our website. 
Well, welcome back. This is the in the news portion of the show as we wrap up here. And uh, it doesn't take very long. Uh, you can just get on any news website and you always see stuff about the creation evolution debate in the news. Yes. And so this particular article here titled, Scientists Say Jawbone Fragment Dating Back 2.8 Million Years Evidence of Earlier Evolution. So here, here's what happens all the time. Constantly the public is flooded with new evidence of evolution. So yes. it just appears to people that the evidence is overwhelming in, overwhelmingly in favor of evolution and so right. on, and, and uh, they're just constantly inundated with it. But as we read the article here, uh, something to notice. Notice the difference between the facts that they found. Yeah, what's actually observed. What they've observed, what you can take, hold in your hand, test, and all that kind of stuff. And then the assumptions that they make from these things. Now you can take facts and, and try to figure out things, but you know when they're talking about science proves this and science proves that, yeah. there's a different type of proof going on here. So let's look at the difference between facts and interpretations. Um, I'll start off. A fragment of jaw bone dating back 2.8 million years is evidence that the first humans evolved more than 400,000 years earlier than previously thought, scientists reported Wednesday. Well, we could probably start there and analyze this. Yeah, Number so one, what did they find? It was a fragment of jawbone, yeah. right? That, you, you can pick that up and hold it in your hand. That's, that's the fact. Yeah. And then what's the interpretation? Dating back 2.8 million years. Okay. How did you do that? Did, Has anybody observed those 2.8 million years? No, nobody, you're, nobody was there 2.8 million years ago to see that animal die. You're or, making or assumptions. Yeah. They're going to talk about, if you, if you pin them down, they'd say, well, we've got these dating methods that prove it's 2.8 million years. And yet, the very next statement yeah. says that the first humans evolved more than 400,000 years earlier. Okay, so is that a fact or is that an right. interpretation? Before uh, an they idea. got this evidence, yeah. was that date a fact? Right? Yeah. Anyway. Yep. Yeah. You guys are getting the idea, I hope. The fossil, which was uncovered in the Afar region in northern Ethiopia, is dated very close to the time that the humans, that the human or homo genus or group split away from more ape-like ancestors, like Australopithecus uh, afarensis, best known uh, for the uh, fossil skeleton Lucy discovered in 1974. Africa is a hotbed for human ancestor fossils, and scientists from Arizona State University have worked for years at the Ethiopia site trying to find fossils from the dimly understood period when the Homo genus arose. Um, and our species, Homo, uh, Homo sapiens, is the only surviving member of the group. Okay, so there's been a lot of storytelling there, not a whole lot of facts. The, the jawbone, the human jawbone, was listed first there. Yep. Uh, then it continues, the jaw fragment, which includes five teeth, was discovered, that's a fact, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, okay, we five can see teeth, that. you yep. can see the teeth there, was discovered in pieces one morning, Jan January 2013, by this fella here, I can't <laughs> pronounce, I'm not even gonna try, uh, an Ethiopian graduate student at Arizona State. He said, he uh, spotted the tooth poking out of the ground while looking for fossils. Yep. Okay, so there's some facts there. The guy ran along, th saw the thing, and yep. okay, there it is. Yep. Uh, had five teeth. And, <laughs> and as you read the, the, uh, the article, and we could continue on here, but th this would be a good exercise for people to do. Yeah. Do themselves. Yep. Look it up, look at what they found, and, and look at what the, the interpretations are. Next week, tree dating. Uh, does it disprove the biblical time scale? Next week.